of Florida gardening. This is where I grew up. I grew up in South Florida. I had an uncle who moved to the Ocala area. And when I was a teenager, I would go and visit him. And one, one summer, he said, you can come work for me. He did aluminum installations. So they would put those nice sunrooms on the back of trailers in these retirement communities. And so I wasn't talented enough to do any of that kind of stuff. So my job was like to bust up rocks and to carry things and to just do whatever the guys said on the construction crews. But I really liked that. Look at all these trees. I mean, down in South Florida, it's, it's like there's a lot of city. But when you get up to, to North Florida, there's all that. Well, there's no trees. Like, it's very different. And it struck me as really beautiful. And I said, you know, when I get older, I'm going to move up there. I like the country. I like that they had chickens in their backyards and, and that sort of thing. Fort Lauderdale has the nickname Fort Liquordale. Everybody goes down there and party. And, and they control everything about your life. Like in your backyard, yes. You could grow the most amazing stuff. You could grow mangoes. You could grow mangoes and papaya and bananas and it never freezes. There was a, one of my neighbors had a beetle palm. The beetle palm is what they chew in Indonesia. They, they chew the nuts and it makes it, their mouth, the saliva all red. It's this mild stimulant and they'll spit, and it looks like they're spitting blood all day. The beetle palm is a very, very tropical tree. It grows right down there at the very, very bottom of Florida. It's like amazing, but they control everything about your life, so it's kind of difficult to live there. So I said, I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna, what, uh, can you not hear me? I'm gonna have to yell, or I'll just come down here. Can you adjust the camera? Because uh, apparently there's supposed to be a sound guy, but there's no sound guy. Uh, so we don't have a mic. So when I moved up to North Florida, I had been gardening in South Florida in my parents' backyards, and it had been a long series of annual gardens and planted cactuses and all that kind of stuff. And every kind of little interesting thing that some older lady in the neighborhood would find out I liked gardening, she'd be like, do you ever grow lilies? Here's some these lilies. And I would plant some lilies in the backyard. And somebody would say, oh, you should grow these, and you should try these, try these beans. A friend of mine gave me some beans. I grew the beans and they were some bean from the Orient and they climbed up onto the roof of the house and they started covering the side of the house and the stalks got about that big. Some sort of a lab lab bean. I wish I could find them again because they were the scariest beans I ever grew. They're outrageous. They covered the whole side of the house. My dad's like, all right, that's enough gardening there. We're gonna have to take those beans down before the shingles start rotting. But when I moved up to North Florida, I brought some mango seedlings with me and I planted them in the yard and of course they all froze and I thought well maybe if they're in a little sheltered location they won't freeze. No, they still froze. And things were a little bit different. Suddenly I could grow peach trees and blueberries and the stuff that most Americans would consider, you know, your, your favorite fruit trees, you know, apples, and pears and that kind of thing. You could go, oh, well, now we're in a temperate zone instead of a tropical zone. But I had all that experience in that really bad sand of South Florida. And I moved up to North Florida and I learned how to garden again. And so for about 10 years, I was homesteading in North Florida. And then we spent five years in the tropics and I got to experiment with all the tropical plants that I ever wanted to experiment with. And I kind of got it out of my system. We got the pandemic kicked us out basically and we came back. And now we're in lower Alabama, which is zone eight, which is the frozen north, you know, compared to basically this area this area is actually going to be colder tomorrow than it will be in lower Alabama because we're slightly closer to the ocean, I'd say. So, looking at how to grow in Florida, I've titled this talk, Why You Can't Grow in Florida. Has anybody had trouble gardening in Florida? We have a bad reputation. People often move to Florida and then they'll tell you you can't grow nothing in Florida. You can't grow anything in Florida. I tried this and I tried that. My grandma grew the best beefsteak tomatoes. Every year she would put out 200 quarts and she grew the most amazing tomatoes. It was, it was incredible. I tried them in Florida and they all died. And I'd be like, well, 
Yeah, it's because they don't like Florida. Florida has a particularly unique climate, and by unique, I mean you could say painful, because we swing back and forth between some of these freezes and some of these other problems. And so I had I had my my daughter make a list for me. And so we're gonna cover three things. Here are the three reasons why you can't garden in Florida. Or why you're not gardening in Florida. Well, number one is the wrong plants. Number two is the wrong methods. Number three is the wrong time. So we'll cover the wrong plants first. When I moved to North Florida, I decided to test as many plants as possible. Instead of going for what the gardening books say to do, I decided to go with what the climate said to do and what the bugs said to do. If you pay attention, instead of when something dies going, oh, what should I have sprayed or what should I have done? Maybe we should ask the question, should we have even tried to grow that thing? That might be the wrong thing, right? If you try to have a little penguin attraction in Miami, penguins might not be very happy. If you try to grow orchids in Alaska, the orchids are not gonna be happy. So a lot of what's happening is we're taking the knowledge that we've gotten from gardening books or from YouTube and we're saying, hey, let's apply that and look at what a great job so-and-so has done. Look at how that, they've got this, this deep mulch garden and he's, and he's pulling out all these cabbages in, in August. Look at the August. He's harvesting cabbages in August. Where is he? Oh, he's in England. Well, you could follow to the letter what that expert is doing. Agriculture is not for dumb people. We get people, people have this idea like farmers man, and it's like the bottom, right? I mean, you, you want to go and you want to get a job as a doctor or something like that. You don't want to be a farmer. There is so much thinking that goes into farming and trying to have things work. It's actually, it's like when you scratch the surface, oh, it's really simple. It's dirt, it's soil, it's some seeds. You kind of plant it at the right time of the year. You feed it a little something and you get a, you get a harvest. But it gets way, way, way more complex than that because each crop that we grow has a huge amount of genetics behind it. There's all these different heirloom varieties and there's hybrid varieties and there's modern selections and there's, there's, there's everything. Like if you look at corn, there's flint corn and there's flower corn and there's sweet corn and there's super sweet corn. And there's corn that gets this tall and it produces in a very short period of time. And then there's corn that gets 12 foot tall and it takes 125 days to make ears. There are all kinds of different corn, and it's because this little this box called corn that God designed at some point, so here's the corn box. There's this massive amount of genetic potential inside of it. So you've got corn that grow really well way up north, and then you've got corn that grows down in Mexico, and there was a variety of corn down in Grenada that people would plant. They were about that tall, and it would make ears, and you didn't have to water it. You just kind of stick it in the ground at the right time of the year, and it would grow. But I imagine if I took that corn and I tried to grow it right here, it wouldn't grow the same as it grew down there. Because all those other bits of corn, all those other genetics of corn, didn't work so well there, and that's the one that survived. And so what I did was I decided to throw things at my yard. Instead of saying, okay, like I knew a few things worked really well. Sweet potatoes. I mean, sweet potatoes aren't that hard. You know, sometimes you maybe overfeed them or they got a little crowded and you dig them up and you're like, where are my sweet potatoes? There's nothing here but vines. And then you're like, well, actually, we were just growing them for the greens. I love the greens, you know. No, actually, you were trying to grow the roots, but but at least, well, see, I got greens, you know. I feel that won't fill you up. You might look at something else and go, okay, um, the Everglades tomatoes, right? Those grow really, really easy. There, you get tons and tons of tomatoes, little little half wild sweet tomatoes. So I knew that some of these things would do okay because there was enough on the record where people were like, ah, you can't kill that thing. That's easy. But I didn't, I didn't know enough. What I wanted from my yard was I wanted a garden that I didn't have to work at, that I didn't have to go and spray all the time. I don't like spraying. I don't really like having to stay on top of stuff. I don't like having to, to fight with the pests. 
So one of the main questions I get is what do you do about the pests? And often I ignore them. Or if I see them, I squish them. Like, ah, get off of there, you know. But I don't do a lot about the pests. Because I tend to think if it, do, if it doesn't survive the pests without me doing a lot of work, I don't really want to deal with it that much. So what we did when we moved to our yard, we, we put in some garden beds and we tried different, different types of garden beds. We, we tried spacing things a little wider and a little tighter. We did a little John Jeeves, we did a little square foot, we did a little, little bits and pieces. We did row gardens and then I borrowed a piece of land and we planted three foot apart without irrigation in another spot. We just tried and tried and tried. And then every year, instead of planting like one variety of tomato, like we wouldn't get our heart set on a particular thing. If you get your heart set on a particular thing, like that beefsteak tomato, your heart will be broken. You have to be cold. You, you, have, to, you have to just say, well, it may work, it may not, and plant a whole bunch of different stuff. And then you just pay attention, okay, which plant lived? Which thing actually did really well? I had somebody say, you know, there's this vegetable, it starts with a Z, I don't like to say it because it's disgusting. But it's a it's a cucurbita pepo. Let's just call it let's just call it uh cucurbita vulgaris. The vulgar cucurbit. Anyhow, so everybody says, man, I've been you know, in the Midwest, we get, uh, you know, there's a season and people get all these boxes and, uh, you know, you leave your, and there's like a, a time when you leave them on the neighbor's porch and you feel, you, you can't leave the windows in your car rolled down because it'll get full of those things. Somebody just pour them in there. Uh, and, and so you try and grow them in Florida, right? And what happens? It starts to grow real nice and big. And one year you might do real well. Oh, look at it. We got all these, we got all these things. Let's go find a trash can, you know. But you got, you get it real well, but then, then the next year, maybe you plant it there and it gets real big and green and it looks real good. They got this nice cucurbita pepo bush. And then suddenly the whole thing just goes <sighs> overnight. What happened to that? What happened? Who did you did that, didn't you? You know, it's like the, the dog did it or somebody did. What happened to it? We got a vine borer. Oh, I hate those things. They just get in the middle and they tear their way right through the vascular system and then it's done. You don't usually get piles of them in Florida. Unless you're out there spraying and picking and watching it, you're out there with like a sniper rifle at night looking for the monster to come light. It's obnoxious. Okay, so let's see what else in that family works. Let's try a bunch of stuff. Cucumbers. Cucumbers are pain in the neck, aren't they? You get those cucumbers where they're about that big and they've got like one little bit off to the side? Why did you stop? It's like a kid's like, I'm gonna blow this balloon up. <laughs> Don't tie it! You're not done blowing it up yet! Or if he comes, it's like, what is that thing? And then they start turning yellow on the vine, and you know, it's like, okay, that's sad. Cucumbers, like rich soil and proper moisture conditions and stuff, right? You, know, you read about, oh, they like rich soil. And they're not hard to grow, you should be able to get buckets of them. I always follow cucumbers. But we had these Indian neighbors when I was growing up, and they had these little teeny cucumbers that would grow on their fence, and they would cover the fence, and we would go over there as kids and we would eat them. And I was like, what type of cucumber is that? That is so productive. And I, I finally found out what it was. It's called Cassinia grandis, the ivy gourd. It's in the cucumber family. So I look it up, state of Florida, class one, non-native invasive cucumber. That's an invasive species. 35, let's see, 35 years after I was a little kid. So it was about 35 years later, probably from the time the Indians had planted those cucumbers. I went over there and I took a look at their, that they, they were long gone. They, they bought two liquor stores and they like moved up. They moved to West, where it's like where the rich people live, right? So they had one liquor store when we were kids and they were kind of struggling. And Two liquor stores out to Weston. But the cucumbers had been on the fence. So the neighbor next door is this Puerto Rican guy, a friend of mine. And I'm, I'm in his backyard and he's showing me the, the soursop tree he's got growing. And I said, wait a minute, look at that vine coming through your fence. That's a cucumber vine. Those cucumbers have been growing there for 35 years. 
I could barely get a cucumber to live for 35 days. There are years, there are times, there are great, when you get just the right amount of compost and you don't get real hot and real cold, you don't get the bugs. There are times when you can go, oh man, I got cucumbers this year, it did really well. And there's some gardeners who just really naturally have a connection. I got to fight, I got to fight through cucumbers. But when I found those cucumbers, I was able to get some and plant them, and then I had tons and tons of cucumbers. But now I'm a criminal because they're class one non native invasive species. So everybody's just taking ideas of the cucumbers. What cucumbers? You know, in the alley behind the Dollar General, <laughs> City of Grandis. <laughs> you know, so I tried a couple other things. Took a I planted white potatoes. I love growing white potatoes. White potatoes can actually grow pretty well in Florida. They like the sand. They do pretty well sometimes. Sometimes they do horrible. What kills your potatoes? Have you had anybody had their potatoes get killed? What killed your potatoes? Do you know what it was? Worms. They just got in and chewed them up. There's another thing that I had kill them too. I didn't have the worms kill mine. I had, I actually had termites get in potatoes once, but might have been sweet potatoes. They chewed up, it's like that, okay, that's weird. Well, they probably were hard as wood anyways, and wouldn't want to eat them. They got confused. But, uh, fire ants. Got into the middle of all my white potatoes, I was trying to grow white potatoes. They just chewed the uh, root system down, and so you get these little potatoes that you're trying to harvest out of the ground, like, you know, so they didn't get bit up and then just covered them. I wasn't very happy with them. So, yeah. here my pocket, one second. The, uh, <coughs> I'm getting over a cold. I wasn't sure I was going to be here. It's not that old crowd, I don't think. You can never know. It could be the next thing. I always hope I'm going to discover the next cool thing. So, the sweet, potato, the sweet potatoes did pretty well for us. Potatoes didn't do very well. It says, okay, so what do they what do they eat in the tropics? We're almost in the tropics. Let's try cassava. Let's see how that does. And let's try true yams. So when I discovered Dioscoria alata, I think I originally discovered Dioscoria alata, the true yam, the water yam, the greater yam, uh, because of green bean. I think it was a green bean video because I was always going, man, can you eat those air potatoes? Well, you can, uh, but they cause vomiting and sterility and baldness and, I mean, in a pinch. Um, but it's unfortunate because they're so prolific. I was thinking, they look like potatoes. Let's just boil them and eat them. I boiled some and gave them to the chickens. The chickens ate them, and I, I don't know if they went sterile or not. I didn't ask them. It's kind of personal. But... I said, you know, I see that you know, there's an edible variety of it. So there's the edible cousin, the Ascoria Alato. Okay, cool. I'm going to try and grow that. So I grew that. My white potatoes covered in fire ants, struggling. Some of the ones that didn't get hit by the fire ants, I get a few good potatoes. Man, those potatoes are so good when you grow your own potatoes. They taste great. But then I stuck these pieces of yam around and I pull out roots that are this big. And I. And I looked it up, okay, but well, what's the calorie content of this root? I got a, I got a uh, 29 pound root. How many calories are in this thing? It's about 10,000 calories. So this could feed an adult male for five days. Huh. I'm starting to not miss the potatoes so much. <laughs> Especially the small amount of work I did. I found out they're also on the class one non-native invasive species list. But they have cousins that are not that grow just as well. I found out that uh, you could just take a piece of it and stick it underneath the tree and ignore it. Or stick it on the, the side of the fence and ignore it. And it grows. I didn't have pests getting into it. I didn't have bugs getting into it. I didn't have problems like I had with the Yankee vegetables. So I wasn't struggling. I'm like, okay, so, so my primary goal is to get enough food for the family. I want food. I don't want a, a hobby. I feel like 
things could get bad or I could maybe not have work or I could get sick or something like that. And, and then what do we got? We're gonna go dig up the, you know, the little square foot garden and, and eat for what, a day? Radishes, jalapenos, doesn't fill you up very much. So I, I was like, okay, my goal is survival gardening. Survival gardening, like what could I eat? How did people eat? You know, how do people eat in the third world where they can't just go out and buy everything really simply? So I tried to take their crops and some of their ideas and bring it up to Florida because we are closer to the Caribbean and to the great wonders of the tropics than we are to New England where all the pretty gardens are. All those little beautiful gardens in the apple orchards and stuff, you see the apples here? They're like, we're at the bottom, kind of the bottom for where apples are happy. They don't, they, they, they get lichens all over them and they look kind of weird, but I've been up to the, I've been up to Appalachian and I've seen an apple orchard and gone, whoa, they're so pretty. And the apples taste so good. That, that's like they're made for it. So what's made for Florida? That's what you start with. And so what you do is you plant a whole bunch of stuff and you can't even pronounce it, but the Vietnamese guy that you met at work is growing in his backyard say, okay, I want to plant that thing, whatever it is, I'll figure out how to eat it later. So most everything is going to be good. There's, there's like, I mean, there's only roots, you know, there's sweet roots and there's starchy roots. Generally, roots are roots. You can find a way to cook them. You know, if you put enough cheese and bacon on anything, you can eat it. So that was the, that was the first thing was the, my eyes went, my eyes were opened by, I'm not growing the right stuff. Why am I struggling so hard to grow white potatoes? Well, I want to grow a few because I love the flavor. They make great french fries. But these yams, I can dig giant amounts of food and I know that I've always got that. And when my wife baked them, she boiled them, smashed them, put butter and salt on them, she made mashed yams and we served them. Uh, we had a friend over and she's like, you know, have, have some and he had some. And she says, do you know what that is? <laughs> you never want that at the table. You know what that is? <laughs> uh, never mind. Just, just enjoy it. It's good. No, it's, it's a yam. It's a yam. He goes, oh, I wouldn't have known it wasn't, it wasn't baked potatoes. Kind of a bland baked potato. Great. So then we're like, okay, what do we grow for greens? We discovered longevity spinach. Anybody growing longevity spinach? That's one of tree spinach is uh, Mexican tree spinach, the chai. Have you grown that one with the kind of the maple shaped leaves? <laughs> oh yeah, it'll frost off. Usually they come back from the roots or they'll come back from a little lower down. So we grew that, we grew a uh, Suriname purslane. Basically every weird thing that I could find, I acquired it and threw it in the backyard and said, which ones of these things don't die? because I'm so tired of fighting with the sand and the weather and the heat. So you've got to get through this really nasty humid cycle with lots of heat, and then it gets too cold. Okay, what's gonna live through all that? Let's just throw genetics in the backyard and then see which things live. And so after that work in South Florida and then in North Florida, that's when I wrote Totally Crazy Easy Florida Gardening. So that book is basically based on the idea of, okay, you're gonna survive. What's going to survive in your backyard without you just killing it? because there's certainly food that grows in Florida. Look at all the greenery and growth around us. There's so much stuff that grows here and a lot of our wild weeds are edible. Everybody always say, you know, you can just forage. Yeah, but you can't, I mean, unless you feel like you're like hunting deer. And there's, there's like 3,000 types of leaf you can eat, but that doesn't really satisfy you very much. But you can get a lot of nutrition out of eating a lot of those leaves, like our Biden's Alba, the, um, Spanish needle, you know, uh, or shepherd's needle. You can, those are great. They're very nutritious for you. They're a pretty good green. They taste sort of weirdly grassy. I kind of like it. The first try, you're kind of like, that's sort of strange. And you start craving it and then you start having dreams and waking up and pulling it out your backyard and you don't remember who you are. No, it's, it's a perfectly good uh, vegetable, but it's, it's, you know, you, you're not growing in your garden. You try to grow lettuce, which has like, like this much nutrition in it and it's got aphids all over it, and you're about ready to get a can of Raid and spray the aphids, you're so mad. But then you've got all these weeds that are like super nutritious and really easy to grow, but it's getting the, the calories in your stomach 
that's really the hard part of it. If you're not out hunting, there's not a lot of real wild roots in Florida where you could go out and just kind of poke around with a stick and be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna dig up some of these. You know, you gotta plant your own. And so that's kind of what we did. Okay, what's our staple, what's our staple roots? What are we gonna survive on? Let's find the stuff that takes almost no work and then grow that first. And then our nutritionist, our nutritional greens, we grow some things like kale and collards and mustard and stuff I really like to eat. And that gets, that gets added into it. And then the last thing you do is like, okay, what about my uh, nutritional, medicinal herbs and my flavor? So some cayenne peppers, you know, you can grow some green onions and that sort of thing. Once you've got your big, your calories, your nutrition, and then that last little slice is like your, your real medicinal stuff and your real flavorful stuff that really doesn't fill you up, but it makes life a lot better. You know, so that's that's the the first thing you do is you try to throw. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to check my. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing is the wrong plants. The reason you fail in Florida is the wrong plants. They're not adapted to the climate. They don't do well. They die. And how many times have you read the benefits of a raised bed garden? There's like all these raised bed gardens. Raised bed garden. Now look at. I'm not judging you guys. I know some of you have raised beds at home. Because it's so nice to just make a little box and put some good dirt in it and then plant in it. And it looks like, this is like one of those beautiful DIY projects. Look at my raised bed garden, it looks great. A little four by eight in the backyard. I mean, lumber is only like $300 a board foot right now. So, those radishes. Um, but the, the, the problem with the, with the raised bed thing is what they say the benefit is of it up north. So I've read so many gardening books. I'm kind of crazy, I'm, a, I'm kind of a book junkie. But one thing I read in a lot of the northern books is the benefits of a raised bed garden. First of all, they warm up faster in spring. Is that good in Florida? You want the soil to get nice and hot fast. Huh. We don't want it to warm up fast in spring because your pak choy goes boom, flowers. It's like mid-February, boom. No, you want it actually cooler soil. It's better. So it warms up faster in spring and it drains well. Well, it, okay, so if you got clay soil, raised beds are a good idea. You got nice thick soil. If you've got sand, Right? You pour water into it, it goes, it's right through. And raising the sand higher means that it's just gonna drain. So there's water in the soil, you raise something up higher, that water wants to go down. It goes down fast. So our raised beds, we found that we had to water more than the beds we built directly in the ground. They, especially when the plants were young, before they got the roots down through the bottom of the bed, you put a little seedlings and stuff, and you're watering them and watering and watering them. The other thing that we do is we plant too close. If you plant plants really close, they crowd in on each other and they don't spread out. And we feel bad. We feel really bad when we, I mean, you go out there with a pair of scissors, right? You've got like three perfect looking little lettuces next to each other, and it's like, Who's going to die today? You know, you're looking and you're just like, it's like playing lifeboat. It's like, what is your moral code? Who do you kill to save the rest? And it's kind of a bad feeling. You like, stand out there with the scissors. They were so young, you know. But you gotta do it, because if you don't do it, either, either you're going to like carefully plant a seed and then step over here and plant another seed and, and you're like, okay, let's see, that's about two and a half feet, you know? Or you overseed, which most of us do because we saved last year's seeds and we're not sure if they're gonna come up, so we throw a few extra in there. That'll probably do. If you don't thin it and they all come up on top of each other, what you get is you get these little beets. You're pulling out like one big beet, it's about that big, and then you got two or three little ones kind of sticking off the side because you didn't get around to thinning it. Or you get these little teeny lettuces that all stick together like this for about a month, and then one of them becomes a monster over the top, but it's still not as big as it would have been. You don't get full genetic expression because they're crowded in on top of each other, they get stressed out. 
and we have such limited soil moisture and nutrition in our soil here that when the roots touch and they start to fight for resources inside of the soil, now they're all trying to grab the same stuff and they're sending out compounds saying, get out of my space, get out of my space, get out of my space, and they fight and they kind of choke each other. So by putting everything together in a raised bed, hotter, drier, you may be able to put really good soil in it, which is a benefit. If you are gonna do a raised bed, I, I highly recommend going like, making a deep raised bed, making a ton of compost, and maybe putting a bunch of rotten wood in the bottom of it, so when they go down there, they got that spongy layer. That's really nice. But, but that's good for maybe your backyard herbs and, and salad garden. It's not really so hot if you're trying to survive a garden, right? Because like, if you want to grow a bunch of potatoes or something, the amount of work that you got to do building the beds is really pain in the neck. So what you do is you space them out a little wider, and you know that Florida sand doesn't really like to improve. You seem like you make compost every year and you throw it at the ground, and then the ground still looks like sand. It's just, it's terrible. It's terrible because the geology is against you. It eats it. It eats compost. The ground just, between the heat and the biological activity, plus most Florida soils do not have enough clay to make that humus stick, that it just doesn't want to do it. So what I found is, if I go a little wider, rough the ground up, and I plant wider, kind of like the settlers used to do it, I don't have to water as much. And I don't have to feed as much because roots are actually really good at hunting through the soil. If a plant is in a pot or in a constrained space, the roots can only get what you give to it. If you put it in the ground and you see the root systems, a diagram of the root system of a watermelon, for example, is unbelievable. Those roots can go eight feet down on the ground and they will go eight feet to each side of the vine or more. And they just go, there's this huge mass of roots. You pull it up and you see this little bit of roots, but you've broken off tons of filaments that are going down to the microscopic level and they're doing this all the time. But when you jam them close to each other, they all just kind of pack up and they don't like it. So part of our problem is we're trying to use techniques for fertile soil, for rich soil. We're gonna build humus. We're gonna build this amazing black dirt and you can do it for a while. You can, you can have the tree company dump tons and tons of mulch and then you pull the soil back and it's like it's really black under there and it's all full of earthworms. But if you rake the mulch off the top and you just ignored that area for a year or two, you let it go back to weeds, it would be surprising. It's, it's horrible how it goes back to sand. That area could have been a cow pasture with cows on it for 50 years and it's rich, thick, full of all that manure. And then the first couple of years, the soil fertility is just drop, 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 and then it's back to sand because we're constantly getting the sun beating down on it. We're getting all that rain. And between those two things, you're just draining it out. So first of all, you get the right plants. And then second of all, you've got to use methods that are a little more old fashioned. Sometimes, one thing I found was to keep, to keep those plants that are in poor, unfertile soil um, using liquid fertilizers instead of necessarily trying to build the soil. I like to put some compost in the soil. Anytime I can, I get compost in the soil. But sometimes you almost teach, treat the soil like it's a, it's a hydroponic medium. It's like sand that's just holding the roots there and you water them with something that has a little bit of fertility in it. So you take some chicken manure and put it in a barrel, make a manure tea, comfrey leaves, any kind of nitrogen fixture leaves. You go and get some kudzu by the side of the road, put it in a barrel, and let it rot down and take that water and just go water along all the all the rows. The plants will respond to that because it's flowing past the root zone and they're getting the, the nutrients. But you know, an extra rain just goes through. I threw out um, triple 13 to try and get some turnips to grow in this real bad area. I threw, threw out the triple 13 and I did what the deer plot guys do, and I spread out the seeds and the triple 13 at the same time. I was like, I just got to put some of that triple 13 out there. But bit some of that. Yeah, you got the plot mix, and, and it's like, you got oats. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna try that. So I go and I throw it out there. Well, I mean, after, it comes out real lush and green. It's like this big mat of turnips. I'm like, hey, that's pretty good. And then after about 
I mean, you probably got about 10 inches of rain. Suddenly the, the edges of the leaves start to get yellowy. It's like the turnips went, yes! And then they went, oh wait, there's nothing down here. It's just empty. And then the, the, the leaves start to get yellow at the edges and then they start to get brown spots on them. And then the aphids and stuff come in. I'm like, there's no, there's no life in it. So you gotta go out there and throw the triple 13 again. It's like, I don't wanna do that. There's plenty of other ways you can do it. Dude, so if you've tried the Dave's Fetid Swamp Water method, anybody tried that? Take a barrel, I call it Dave's Fetid Swamp Water because it stinks, it's anaerobic decomposition. So you take a bunch of leaves, take grass, you take your kitchen scraps, you take a bunch of slop. You're trying to get as wide a range of nutrients as possible. Throw a little compost in there, throw a little chicken manure in there, and you let it rot down for about two to three weeks in a barrel, and you stir it every once in a while, and methane bubbles come up. But what's happened is, is all that all that fertility that was in all those weeds and stuff you put in there, just get the greenest looking stuff you can find and throw it in there and rot. It makes this this tea, which is like swamp water. All the minerals have dissolved into that water and have rot down to the water. And then you just dip in a watering can. You take the take the rose off the front because if you leave the sprinkler head on the top of it, it gets clogged up. And you take take it down there and you just go water down the rows and soak the ground with it. Particularly when it's been kind of dry and you're not getting enough water and you go down there and you water with it, things will just perk up and they start growing. Because you just took all of your enemies and composted them. So all of those weeds from the garden, you just throw them in there and let them rot. And you just make a tea and you can just leave that sitting out there for forever. It helps if you cover it though because the mosquitoes will get into it and they'll, they're a problem. But mosquito larvae are also high in energy. So if you pour them out on your crops, it's no big deal. You can, you can totally just feed the mosquito larvae to it. Somebody's like, I have mosquito larvae in it. Do I need to throw it out? It's like, yeah, throw it out on the corn. Don't waste it. <clears throat> the last key, and this is one that I have a problem with. I am not particularly good at schedules and stuff. Hey. What's that? Oh, I think we're fine. I'm almost done anyways. Okay. Good, thank you. Uh, so if, if, you, if you plant in the wrong time, if you plant when the seed package says in Florida, you will suffer. You will learn pain. It is so sad, right? Plant after all danger of frost. Okay. So like two weeks after the last frost, it's 90 degrees. Especially around here, right? It's like, boom! How could it go from 85 to 25 to 85 again? That's rough. Planning after all danger of frost is really hard. Fortunately, Florida doesn't really have one growing season. We have two main growing seasons and two secondary growing seasons. The two main growing seasons are your spring from when it's cool, or basically February, March, April, May. And then it starts to get pretty hot in June. You better be pulling stuff. You better, you better have had a harvest coming in by June or you're kind of getting in trouble. There's not much left. June, July, August, September. It's good for catching fish and that sort of thing. It's not so good for gardening. That's a secondary growing season. Your summer growing season, you're pretty much limited to like to the crops that can really take the heat and the bugs. Your second major growing season pretty much starts towards the end of September and into October. And it's often even too hot to really plant, you know. They'll say you could plant a second row of second set of cabbages, right, in September, October, but sometimes it's still 95 degrees. Cabbages don't even come up. Or it's like maybe they did come up and something just ate them right away because they never seem to do well until it gets like October, November. But you can start the second, you get the second. I find the fall gardening season sometimes works better for me than the spring gardening season. But we have these erratic frost events. So you're pretty much looking at your cool season stuff some of your cool season stuff goes right through the winter, like your collards, your kale, 
and cabbages, if you keep the cabbage worms from destroying them and you have rich, fertile soil and you get the timing right. But then you're, you're kind of, it's just over sometimes. The frost just hits and it's over, or the heat hits and it's over. And so you're, you're racing the heat in the spring. You're trying to get stuff and you're hoping it's gonna stay cool. And then in the fall, you're hoping that it doesn't freeze and take it out, take out what you grew. Those are your two seasons, and they kind of change a little bit from year to year. Sometimes you get a longer, cooler spring, and sometimes it's hot right away, and that's it. And that's just the nature, that's just the nature of Florida gardening. It, it rotates a lot. Our weather patterns are constantly going back and forth. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell if the earth is getting colder or it's getting warmer. From Florida, I have no idea. It's like every year something is like, oh, I never did that before. That's weird. You know, it's just constantly shifting. There's like So if you get your timing right, you start with your, your, your cool season stuff, your Yankee vegetables. You can grow your Yankee vegetables, you know, often, sometimes you can even get them in as early as January, depending on how close you are to the coast. The closer you get to the coast, the more you get the moderation of the ocean. If you're right in the dead center of the state, right along the ridge, you don't get that moderation, and it's it's hard it's harder to know what's going to happen and if they're going to do well. But you get your your seed packets may say plant after all danger of frost, but you're probably going to want to try and get ahead of that. And you know that you're going to lose some. Some years it's just going to happen. That's why I recommend usually planting from seed rather than planting from from buying transplants because a packet of seed might be a buck twenty. But you can pay like three dollars and forty-eight cents for six transplants, and you might get the timing wrong. Whereas the seeds, eh, I'll just plant again in two weeks. Put it in a row, put it in a row, put it in a row. Whichever one lives, hey, they live. But when you get into the summer, then you're looking at your, your hot climate stuff, and this is where we found that planting some of the weird stuff from the tropics really was a huge blessing for our food supply. The yams, the yard long beans, the real long beans, the noodle beans, those things, they can go through. You can plant them right through the summer. And okra, if you can tolerate okra, okra is fantastic through the summer. But the vegetables that people grow up north through the summer, you know, Peter Rabbit going and getting the cabbages, that's probably in the summer. It's not in the summer here, because if it gets to the summer, your cabbages are long gone. They have, they have been eaten and flown away on the wings of pretty little sulfur-colored moths. So your, your timing is always that, that weird thing for us. So, so, like right now, I am looking at my garden. I am right I'm four miles from the Florida border, so I'm right close. But I'm a pretty solid zone A, zone A B, but it gets cold. And I'm looking at going January. Okay, last January I planted some potatoes. January 29th, I planted my first round of potatoes and they did great. February, mid-February, I planted a second round of potatoes and they did great. March 1st, I planted the third round of potatoes and they did so-so. Got hotter, hotter, hotter in the potatoes. Oh, I think I'm done. And they just die. They die down the ground, you dig what you get. This year, it's way colder this January than it was last January. So you kind of got to ask the old guy in the road, you think it's going to stay cold? Yeah, yeah you don't plant till March. You just ask that guy. You can find that guy. I have a neighbor down the road, this old Creole guy from Louisiana. He works in the oil fields. And he's just like, they can don't play. Don't play it. It's cold. It's gonna stay cold. When it gets like this, it means that winter's running into March. That winter's running right into March. Okay, whatever you say. Last year I planted three rounds. I don't think I'm gonna plant my first round on the 29th because it's gonna be like it's in the 20s. It's in the 20s, it's in the 20s, it's in the 20s. Okay, last year it was up in the 30s. The lowest lows were in the 40s, upper 30s. Nah, I don't like it. So you gotta, you gotta be willing to roll with it. But then, 
if you've got some of those perennial crops, right, and you plant a wide variety of stuff, you're not so limited. So maybe your potatoes didn't do so hot, but you get a long hot summer and your sweet potatoes do awesome. Maybe you don't like sweet potatoes that much, and you really like those true yams with the great big roots. Plant both of them anyways. Plant both of them anyways. So you always got food in the ground. There's gonna be somebody that's gonna eat them. Hopefully. Hopefully you've got friends, or a church, or a food bank, or a neighbor, right? So you've always got the food. The first thing you gotta make sure is you got those calories. And so you plant your white potatoes, you plant your sweet potatoes, you plant your cassava, you plant yams, um, you plant every kind of root that you can think of that will fill your stomach. And also if you can keep a few chickens, keep a few chickens because if you get an over, let's say you got some potatoes that look scabby and you don't really want to eat them, you can always boil a pot out back over the fire cook those potatoes down when they cool off from the chickens and have the chickens turn them into eggs. You want to overproduce as much as possible consistently and you want a mixture of annuals and perennials. In my next talk I'm going to talk about uh, composting and feeding the garden, feeding the garden for free as much as possible. I'll be giving that talk that's tomorrow. And then in tomorrow afternoon I'm going to talk about but in my second talk, I'm going to talk about the grocery row gardening system, which is a combination of orchards and row gardens. So we're taking the orchards and the row gardens and growing them together into edible hedge systems that are very resilient. Whether the climate gets colder or it gets hotter, whether you have a bad spring, late spring, early spring, whatever, we have so many different varieties of food mixed together that you're always going to have something on your plate, which is, I have 10 children. So having food on the food on this like food is kind of primary, you know. Um, otherwise, I'm going to the bank and have to get a loan. So I'm going to call it here and, and take questions. Anybody got Florida gardening questions?